You wrote a blog post a few days ago which pulls back the curtain on the process of writing this book. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, well, I started the book. I wanted to write a book about Paris and food and not with recipes, but more discussing what's sort of happening here in France and Paris. Because, you know, more stories, because I've become more of a story writer than a recipe writer in a lot of ways. And I also think, well, just about every recipe you want has already been written. And you can get it on Epicurious. So what do I have to add to that um, canon of, is that the right word? You're more, you work at the library. <laughs> I make brownies for a living. Um, so I thought, well, what, what can I add to this? And so I spent eight months writing this proposal. And you know, da, 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 it was perfect. And it was 80 pages. Of, and my, editor, my publisher called me and he said, well, this is good, but this is what you should do. You should write a book about how you cook in Paris now and what you do. I was like, I just spent eight months of my life. And he goes, just write like one page of it. So, um, so anyhow, to make a long story short, I actually you know, sat down and thought, well, what do I cook in Paris? Uh, what do, how do I cook today? Which actually has become, um, has prompted a lot of questions to, I wrote a blog post recently about French cuisine. What is French cuisine? And so the bigger question is, how do people Fr in France cook today? What is French cuisine? And you're like, what? I mean, Coco Van's French cuisine, but you go to somewhere like Frenchy or Spring, is that French cuisine? You know, Gregory at Frenchy's French. It's a French. It's in France, in Paris. He's cooking with French ingredients. Is that French cuisine? So it sort of forced me to think about how I cook, um, and it prompted a lot of stories. So the book is a lot of stories and recipes, and we spent an inordinate amount of time coming up with the subtitle until we landed on recipes and stories. <laughs> So the, the simplest solution is always the best. There's some uh, talk of that. Um, but it did take me two years to write. Usually it takes a year to write a book, and then a year of post-production, which means uh, the, you know, the editing, you know, you turn the book, and then they send it back to you, and they X out pages, and you just want to cry, and then you send it back, and then da, 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 da. So um, I, uh, that took a while. I was also, I made the... Uh, I bought an apartment at the same time, which I didn't, which was supposed to be a two-month, a uh, two-month process. Um, and I'm now very, I'm now officially Parisian because I, I have horrible renovation stories. So when people start talking about renovations, I have, I have the best one. So um, well, the worst. <laughs> Although in France, the worst gets the best. So. What has changed in your individual tastes since you arrived in Paris? I eat a lot more sugar. <laughs> I don't know. I eat a lot. Yeah, well, you know, being from California, I've eaten every, you know, we're just used to being, you know, to us, Asian food, Korean food, Chinese food, uh, Mexican food, all the, you know, all those foods are very normal to us. We don't consider them even foreign foods anymore, um, or I don't. Um, so actually, it's been kind of interesting because there's a big North African and Arabic community here that, um, you know, I live over near Belleville, and that I really like. I love, I love all those foods. But they haven't really hit the mainstream. You can get sort of the very base, like, snack examples of them. But nobody's been enterprising enough to open middle-range restaurants like that. What is the hardest thing for you to make in France in terms of ingredients? I would say Mexican, <laughs> although that's changed a lot. I mean, I'd still love to get tomatillos. <laughs> um, I have a can at home. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but now, you know, there's a tortilla maker, and I live close to them, and they're really good. I mean, well, they're pretty good tortillas. The chips are great. Um, and you can get most of those things, but you know, not everything. So Mexican still needs more, more representation. But it's happening. I mean, when I moved here, there was nothing. Uh, yeah. All the Mexican places were horrible. And a friend of mine sent me a picture when she went to a place I won't name, and it was a papaya lobster quesadilla. <laughs> and she had let her uh, her table mates order, and you know she's from California, but they were all and this is not to insult anybody, but they were all French. And <laughs> what is France doing wrong these days in terms of food? Actually, go back. Was it my partner who's here? He's French. He said we were eating Thai food. He goes, "This is my favorite kind of food." It was really hot, so good. Um, it was actually funny you mentioned that because I posted a picture of um, what well, was something on my Instagram stream. Um, it was something to do with uh, maybe sushi, 
Um, and somebody said, how come the Japanese have done such a good job with French pastries, but the French haven't done the same thing for sushi? And, you know, France is, you know, the French view is very narrow and it's very vertical. They see, you know, it's one of the problems is their idea of a restaurant is you sit down and you eat a meal. So the food's really bad on the trains because you don't eat on the train, you know, you eat at a restaurant. So that's why, you know, it's horrible, you know, and the takeout food's pretty bad too because they don't realize, you know, well, takeout food is supposed to be good. Same with, um, you know, certain Asian food. They just don't put the spices and the seasoning in it. They don't realize that that's the food. You know, it's like I tell people it's like making burr blanc without the burr. You know, that's the flavor. It's not just an idea to put in, you know, to help with, you know, help it look nice. How has social media changed the relationship you have with people who read you? Oh, that's funny. Well, so actually, somebody, uh, this woman came up to me on the street about a year ago, and she goes, you're the guy that doesn't follow anybody on Instagram. And I was like, uh, yeah, I didn't realize I was famous for that. Yeah. But um, I actually have a strategy. It's called my exit-only strategy, where I just do whatever I feel like. Um, and I don't, like, any time I hear that word social media guru or SEO expert or someone's going to tell you how to, you know, dial up your presence, I'm like, and I look at their, you know, Instagram stream and they have, like, 22 followers. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, um, but that gives, that make, gives me the creeps. It's like, you know, how to be popular. You know, I'm not popular. I mean, I'm popular online, but in real life I'm not. So there's, there's no formula to be popular. Well, I'm not, you know, I have like four friends. Um, and after tonight, probably two. <laughs> probably one less. Yeah. Two less. Don't call me Josh again. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny, I do a weekly tour every year in Paris, and, you know, there's ten people and, you know, names and everything. And this one, and usually I have trouble remembering people's names. Um, and one week, this woman kept calling me Michael. And so I, I finally, it was like the fifth, fourth day, and I just, I didn't want to go, my name is David. So I had to remind her. That's cute. You stopped working in restaurants in 1999. Have you had offers since? Do you ever reconsider going back to it? How do I make this a new story? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because years ago I was sitting in a bakery with some friends in San Francisco who have bake, and they have, both have bakeries that were very popular. They've actually since closed, um, which is interesting. But I said, I'd really like to open a bakery. And they both like, you know what, you can come and run ours for two weeks while we go on vacation. Um, but I had thought about opening an ice cream shop in Paris because I, and actually I was, now that I think about it, I'm brilliant, because that was kind of the idea before it's time now that all these single subject places are opening. And not that they don't have ice cream here, but, um, you know, the whole Anglo thing is happening. So I would have been rich. I would have been sitting at home in the 16th on my rooftop terrace today. Yeah. With all of you, there would have been lots of wine. Um, but I really wanted to open an ice cream shop. And then I kind of looked at all the paperwork, and I just... just so I just didn't do it. I love, I actually miss working with people. One of the hard things about writing a book is you're cooking alone and you don't have someone to go taste this. What should I do? Um, what do you think this needs? Um, and people can tell you, but like my friend Laurel back there, she came over and she made carrot cake with me for the book. She has a restaurant called Trez, Trez or 13. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 13, yes. Either or. But um, I wanted, I put her carrot cake in the book and she came over and it was just really nice to have someone in my kitchen. So when I was writing the book, because I guess I'm supposed to be looking in the book. Oh, well, actually, you don't have any more copies. So they're all sold. I always talk about, you know, let's complain about it. Something else. No, um, I, well, it was great because I had friends come over and cook with me and it was really fun. So um, maybe that's my next book. Tell us about your famous renovation story. And uh, my friend of mine said, whatever you do, promise you won't write a book about this. Um, and nobody, then I realized when I was all over, nobody would believe me. Because like everything this, uh, this person did was wrong. Like he put the water filter in upside down. It's like behind the wall. And, like, and he's like, oh, I had the same one at home. Um, the funniest thing is um, I wanted USB ports. Because, you know, now when you're doing electricity, you can put USB ports you know, to plug things in, like plug your computer in to charge it, plug. He has these plugs hanging out of the wall. And they're like a little thing dangling down with like the end. I'm like, am I supposed to plug my apartment into my iPhone? And he's like, yeah, it's for, that's what a plug is. I'm like, no, it's the other way. 
then I had a bar stool, I, and they had to, the legs had to be cut, and the first one, he cut th three of the legs to make it lower, because the, the counter was too high, because he screwed that up. And then he cut the other leg, he cut one of the same legs twice, so it was like this much lower. <laughs> and he said to me, he goes, well, some of your friends might be crooked. My friends, or maybe the contractor. So, there's a lot more stories, but what's the next one? Can, can we have the name of the contractor? So we know? No, 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 no. He's no longer with us. <laughs> Don't mess with the pastry chefs. We're, we're nice, but. Yeah. Have you felt a shift on your website in terms of comments you get? Yes, I have. And that's actually a good two part question. The first part, um, I've actually noticed because now there's sort of a shakedown in blogs. What's happening is um, a lot of people are realizing it's really hard. It's a lot of work. They're not getting anything out of it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but people are scrutinizing blogs now. I mean, as soon as I post something, if there's one mistake, if there's one error, within maybe three minutes, somebody's found it. Um, and I've been working with a proofreader, but now it's like, oh my god, this is becoming homework. This is not yeah. becoming... You know, a book is different, it's going to be in your hand, but a blog is supposed to be a diary, it's supposed to have typos, but now, you know, now you can't do that anymore, you know, God for, you know, gosh forbid you, you know, you spell something wrong or you write it's without a contract, you know, it's, it's, people get, you know, so, so, that's kind of actually unfortunate, and I don't know what the, I think that's just the evolution of blogs. Um, the second part of the question was writing about very personal stuff, uh, I've been, if you go way back to my blog before, when I was I was writing more goofy stuff, I was at a different place in my life. So I don't think I've changed the way I write so much as I mean, people are scrutinizing it now, so it's got to be perfect. You know, every you know blog post has to be uh, like New York Times worthy. <laughs> so um, I kind of miss those days. And I had a discussion with a friend of mine who's stopping blogging after about ten years. He's like, you know, I'm just it's just not fun. I can't write about all the stuff I used to write about. And uh, there's certain things like you talk about prefecture stuff that people actually don't want to hear about. Um, you know, if I post a picture of the Eiffel Tower, there's like a thousand likes on Instagram. If I post like a picture, you know, like you know, a pile of paperwork, there's like two. <laughs> no, no one likes that. But also, people don't really want to hear about that side of France. And most of us live here, spend time here, and it's a part of life here. And it's actually some of it's funny, some of it's not so funny. But people actually don't want to hear about stuff like visas and banks and stuff, unless it's, you know, very topical. Since your blog is in English, is your audience mostly Anglophone? Do you feel that the French are not part of the conversation? And I think my partner left, which is good because I started, I always, I start everything with Rom Roman thinks that your Roman says that the French always do this. And when I started doing that, everything stopped. No one bothers me. Um, but actually a third of my readers are from outside the U.S. Um, and I actually just had a comment from a friend of mine who's an editor, because I wrote something like, an Americans in similar cultures, comma, da da da. So well, what's in, what other cultures? And I was like, you know, if I say Australia, New Zealand, you know, UK, you know, someone will say, well, what about Ireland? You know, so I just, you know, you have to speak in general terms. Um, you just have to draw the line somewhere. Um, I realize I write for uh, international audience. I write in metrics. You know, I keep getting letters. You should write in metrics. I'm like, read my blog. I do. So um, I do try. I'm very aware that a lot of people um, from different cultures read my site. So I write with that in mind. Um, there are actually are a lot of French people that read my site. Um, I don't write in French because it's like writing two blogs, and writing one blog is a full-time job, and there's only one of me. And gosh forbid you make a mistake in French. <laughs> I've done that, and it's like, yikes. So I don't write in French. Uh, I thought about it just for fun to keep it from my, and not even make that public just to practice writing in French. Uh, but also, as you know, the one thing is, as the years have gone on, when you when you move here, you're first like, why is it? Why did I strike? And why? Da, 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 da. And all this, say, why the supermarket checker or something? And then you start realizing why uh, people are the way they are, why the French are the way they are, and it becomes more part of you why the social system here is the way it is. And it doesn't always make sense um, to even French people, but um, there's things in America that don't make sense as well. But um, I'm writing about France. People say you should talk about America. I'm like. I don't live in America. <laughs> you mentioned two markets in Paris where vendors grow their own food. 
Which ones are those? And one of them is uh, Batignol, which is in the 17th. Uh, and the other one is uh, the Raspai market on Sunday, which is not so much. Um, it's a little more upscale, like there's the people with the Hermes coats and the, you know, the children in the Hermes outfits. And, you know, and they're buying their, you know, their Swiss chard. Um, but back to your market, I really like. Generally, most markets, as you know, have a couple people who are producers, um, not just negociants. And I make a really strong effort to buy from them. And I buy, try to buy my produce from health food stores as much as I can now because the other stuff I don't like. If an American decided to move to France, should he or she be worried about the food quality here? Yeah. Um, you know, one person we have here is Kristen from the Cal Project. I know, I'm not going to make you stand up, but oh, yeah. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> you know, Kristen, you know, before, when I moved here, I was like, why can't we get why, Cal? Why can't we get Cal? Um, and she was actually somebody who said, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to get farmers to grow Cal. Um, you know, with apologies to anybody who's French in the room, that's a very American thing to do. We are very result-oriented. Um, we believe, like, well, I want to do this, and that's why this, you know, I'm going to help, I'm going to work to make it this way. That's why a lot of these new restaurants that have opened in, in Paris, you know, the article, you know, people said, well, focused a lot on the Americans, or the Australians. I said, well, because a lot of them are responsible, because it's a very American thing to do. French people who are architects who are 40 years old, do not quit their jobs, go to cooking school and open restaurants. You know, you're a chef when you start when you're 15 and you go to cooking school and that's your life. Um, and that's why a lot of the pastry chefs are very, very good because they've been doing it all their lives. The butchers are very good. Um, they've been doing it all their lives, but they don't have that. How can I change something? How can we make it better? So now they're starting to see, um, now French people are doing it. I mean, Gregory did it from Frenchie. You know, he had gone to work in New York and, you know, in England. So a lot of it has been um, started by people who are not French, which is not an insult at all. It's you know, it's just that's the way it is. It's an international city now. You know, people have it. People fetishize Paris, and they think, oh, I want it to be just the way it is, or just the way it was. You know, people write to me and they go, we want to find the, the cute little bistro with the pots on the table, and the young chefs don't want to cook that way. You know, if you grow up eating that food, you don't want, you know, you're, you don't aspire to open a restaurant that you want to, you know, they're watching MasterChef and doing all this stuff, you know. It's crazy, but that's, you know, there'll be a shakedown. Um, you know, living here is very, it's a challenge. Actually, somebody wrote to me recently. She goes, I just moved back to the States, and she goes, that city can kick your butt. Um, a lot of people miss it. Um, you know, the challenges here are like any, you know, it's a, it's a very, you know, the prefecture, the banks, that kind of thing, the customer service. But you have to also look at the other side, you know, the cheese shops, the, the, quality, of, you know, the quality of life on the street. Um, the personal relationships you develop, but it takes time here. It's not like America where you just show up, go to a party, and you've made five friends. You know, here, you know, those people never talk to you again. <laughs> That's why I only have four friends. I'm working on a fifth, so. <laughs> it's taken 10 years. What is the process of writing a cookbook? How do you decide which recipes are going to go in it, for example? First thing, when you do a proposal, um, when your pub a publisher buys your book, they usually specify, I mean, you, you write in the proposal, but they usually specify how many words um, go in the book so they can determine how long it's going to be, how many books go in a box, and so forth. And they don't want you to go over that. Um, usually 100 recipes is about a good goal to shoot for in a book. Um, I think if you go over that, then it becomes a whole different kind of project, and it becomes more encyclopedic, and I don't do those kind of books. Um, Let's see, the other part of the question was, oh, I test things at least three times, um, at least. One recipe I tested 17 times, and it has four components. Um, and I actually am still testing recipes from books that are like years old. I, you know, so I write to the publisher, like, can you change that? Um, so I usually test things at least three times. Um, I was at a culinary conference recently, and this woman goes, I'm writing a cookbook, it's my first book. And she goes, some of the recipes I've had to test like two or three times. And uh, I was with a friend who writes baking books, and she's like, you know, when that woman left, she goes, you're lucky if you get it right the third time. So most recipes get tested more than three times. Um, the challenge in the book actually was coming up with vegetable recipes. Um, I'm actually, uh, the French do have vegetable recipes, but a lot of the, you know, the things like potato gratins and stuff. 
um, and they're not necessarily creative with vegetables. And I'm actually not a creative vegetable cook either, which sounds um, fine. I actually like vegetables very normal. I don't make complicated side dishes generally. They're just, I just roast vegetables um, and things like that. Would you consider doing an online TV show? I'm not really a video person. Um, I did a couple videos and I, um, I liked doing them, but it's very hard to find someone to do them for you, and it's kind of a skill that I don't have, someone to do all the technical stuff. Uh, traditionally, bakers don't do well on television, just in baking shows. And I, this is terrible. I got interviewed to be a judge on one of those competition shows in America, and they did it through Skype, and they were like, it was horrible. I just want, I just wanted to do it because I needed the miles. Because if I got like ten thousand more miles, I'd be like premier junior. Yeah, so I'm like yes, yes, I will, I will come. Yeah, but it was, and they were like, can you now be mean? Like, can you be meaner? I'm like, no. Like, well, you're like funny on your blog, but you're not being funny now. And there you go. These people are just talking to me through the Skype. And it was kind of obnoxious, and I'm not motivated by like success or fame or money, unfortunately. Um, I have other motivations that Grant knows about now, because he knows my secret other account. But um, so it doesn't really interest me, and that's why I like the blog, because I can do what I want, and I can keep it free of any outside interference or people telling me what to do. And that's why I work actually with my publisher, because they don't tell me what to do. And when they do, they usually are right, or we discuss it and vice versa. Although I spelled my editor's name wrong in my blog post. <laughs> she was really sweet. But they spelled my name wrong on one of the promotional things. Okay. What do you think about French pastries? You know, it's interesting because I've been being interviewed a lot. People talk about the downfall of French cuisine and how France is... Yeah, da, 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 da. Um, the other thing they don't talk about is the pastry shops, and you still have really good pastry shops here in Paris. Um, you still have really good bakeries. I was at Paulin the other day with my group, and I, you know, I almost started crying again because I'm in. The, I mean, I'm down there with the with the bakers, and they're putting these. You know, you just you can't believe it. This beautiful love bread, and it's coming out of the oven. These big loaves, and they're just like, you know, it's still made like it was a hundred years ago. Um, so I think that that's very special. Um, it's unfortunate they're losing a lot of that in the countryside. Um, but I think, you know, in Paris, people still support the bakeries, still buy the, f the bread, still support the French, that part of uh, French cuisine. How did you become a chef? Do you have some advice for someone studying pastry? I didn't really um, get a job. I went to school to be a filmmaker, and um, I ended up working at Chez Panisse instead, because I thought, well, I may as well work, you know, if I'm going to work, I may as well work in a restaurant, you know, I'll work at the best restaurant in America. So yeah, I went in there, um, and I got hired, and I stayed there for a long time, um, which is amazing training. I was really fortunate because I worked at a great place where everybody was very interested in doing the best food they could. Money was no object in terms of ingredients. The owner, Alice Waters, absolutely no... You know, she was like, if something wasn't good, it's like, throw it away. Just let's do something better. Let's go to the garden and get some stuff. So that training is just, that's me. I, I can't thank her enough for that. Um, and that, instilling that philosophy in me, and I stayed there forever until they, no. <laughs> um, so my advice to you is actually what I gave to the intern we had on our, on the book project. Um, she was just starting out, and I said, look. I said, you really always want to do a really good job, whatever you do, um, because you always want to work with really good people, and good people want to work with other good people. The worst thing you can do is work with bad people who, are, who suck at what they do. So do whatever you can, suck it up, you know, peel walnuts or something if you have to. Um, that's the job. I had an intern at Chez Panisse once, her first day she said, she was peeling apples, she goes, this is kind of boring. I was like, okay, bye, you know, it's like, you know, this is my job, <laughs> you know, our job is boring, sorry, um, so suck it up, but, you know, don't take any um, grief, um, do not get into, you know, you're a woman, if you ever see one of those articles, like, can women be chefs, or is it okay to cry in the kitchen, like, write the author a letter saying, you know, what an idiot they are, um, don't let anyone push you around in the kitchen, but always do a really good job. What is your opinion of... Christophe Michelac. 
contact with him or to um, a friend of mine who's a woman said he'll only friend women on Facebook. So I tried to friend him just to see if he never friended me back. So. <laughs> um, the other thing was I saw a TV show. Um, it was one of these like chefs. It was uh, in France, uh, like Master Chef, Pastry Chef, or something. Okay, and they were all having this competition. Um, to make something with blueberries, and it was winter, and they were all in the Alps, and they had all these desserts with fresh blueberries. And I think he was on there, not one of the chefs said, why are we doing fresh blueberries in the middle of winter? <laughs> and that just totally turned me off. Not to him. You know, he might have said that they, they might have cut it, but... Um, so I, I... That was my only... <laughs> um, you know, I've never had anything he made. Um, I'm actually not a fancy pastry guy. I actually like, um, I was at Blaise Sucre today, um, and I like what he does because he kind of cooks pastries like a baker rather than as a pastry chef. I think restaurants, like those fancy kind of desserts, work well in certain situations, um, but I'm really much more of a, you know, Eric Kaiser kind of, you know, pistachio financier kind of thing or something like that. Um, when I was at Alan Ducasse last time, they had this dessert, which was grapefruit granita with all these citrus fruits. And it was one of the best things I ever had in my life. It was so simple and so good. Um, so I haven't had his things, but he won't friend me on Facebook. So once he does, I'll... <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll check the, the lean and squeeze. Where can you find good bread in the United States? And I have to say, there was an article recently on like 25 reasons why to move to France. And the first one, number one, was the bread. It was a picture of all these beautiful breads. And I'm looking at them, I'm like, those are from Sebastopol, California. <laughs> They're from Della Fattoria Bakery, um, which has outstanding bread. Um, go to drive up to LA. Nancy Silverton, before she started La Brea Bakery, I thought she was stupid. We were like talking, she's like, I'm gonna open and make you know, bread. And you know, it's a huge success. And this really good bread in America, it's not everywhere because we don't have that culture of buying bread. We don't eat it, you know, people have demonized bread for so long and it's just not something we have, you know, you see that here too, there's Harry's bread, or is that what it's called? Harry's bread in the supermarket. That's in two thirds of French households. So there is a lot of that as well. If you go to the countryside, it's harder to get good bread um, that is in Paris, we're very fortunate. We have a walk-around culture. We can walk places. Um, you know, I live in, there's five bakeries near me, but only two of them are good. Um, but you can get really great bread. And, you know, I'm from San Francisco. We had Acme Bakery. Steve Sullivan, he was the dishwasher at Chez Panisse. And he started making bread after the, sh after the restaurant closed. That's that sort of, you know, mentality, like, I can do it. And he just did it. You know, now he's this huge thing. So... I think there's great bread in America. There's great bread here too. It's just uh, it's just a cult question of um, people buying it. It's, you know, it's also a baguette in like San Francisco's two twenty five, which is probably the that's yeah, actually the closer to the cost of what it's worth. Um, in France, bakers complain because like sixty cents of every baguette goes to like charges, like healthcare charges and rent and electricity. And then the other, they make like 22 cents a baguette. It's kind of crazy, but they can't charge anymore, so.